I imagine at one time you were this brilliant little child. As we enter into adulthood, what was brilliant in childhood can actually get in the way of you living the life you want to live. Hello friends, I'm Nancy Houston. I want to help you live a better life. We're all emotional creatures who sometimes think. And so it's so important that we make this journey from our heads into the depths of our hearts. Welcome to The In-Between with Nancy Houston. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. I have a super special guest, my dear friend, Debbie Wade, who is a sex therapist like yes. I am. And we've both been doing this work for a long time. And so this may not be a show that you want your littles to be listening along with you <laughs> because we're going to have a grown-up conversation about human sexuality. Part of the reason we're both passionate about this topic is, um, I don't know, Deb, if you do this, but when, like when I speak to an audience about sex, I'll ask how many of you received a great sexual education. Yeah. And like, I don't know, a few times I've talked to a few big audiences, like 4,000 people, and maybe four might raise their hand. Right, right. Which is super common. And so, you know, I just believe that um, if we send our kids out into the world without a sexual education, that it's like sending them out not knowing how to read, but worse. Right. Unprotected. Unprepared. Oh, so un Ill-equipped. Yes, yes. And it's really unfair. And so our, what we want to do is just provide a pub public service of talking about sex in some really just honest, frank mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And so we hope that this will bless all of you who are listening today. So Deb, I know that you, um, well, first of all, tell us just a little bit about you. Okay. How far you want me to go back? I know, right? <laughs> right. To the beginning. No. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I, uh, how, did you get, is... how did you get into the field of being a sex therapist. Yes. Okay. There you go. But I really do have to go all the way back. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was raised in a Southern Baptist preacher's family. My father was a pastor 60-something years. Wow. And I am one of these that praise God. I mean, it's one of the sweetest gifts my parents gave me, other than teaching me about Jesus and mm -hmm. having a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. They really spoke in and started teaching my sister and me about healthy sexuality wow. when we were children, about six and eight. Began that dialogue and of it being something that God designed us as sexual beings. I mean, they used books uh, teaching us that uh, there's not anything to be ashamed at wow. sex sexually, yeah. but also taught us privacy and modesty. And I mean, it was just, so I thought everybody got that. Oh my goodness. You know? And so I just assumed my friends were hearing these stories and, and such, um, and I remember one of the books that they gave us. I started my sex education really, really young being a sex educator. Yeah. I just knew my friend, Jenna Hardesty, needed yeah. to hear what her, and just can't in, pace, in case her parents hadn't told her. That's right. I needed her to see the book. Uh -huh. And so I showed her the book. I knew she would be fascinated by the little boy in his penis. Yeah. And it was different from the little girl in her vagina. And right. I thought it was up to me to make sure she knew. Well, that was kind of you. Yeah, I thought it was my job. And my mom caught us doing that. Uh -huh. And instead of mom shaming me, she said, I bet you forgot that we talked about how this is a parent's role oh. to get to teach their kids. And so we're going to let Jana's mother borrow your book. Oh, so oh, I love that. I, <laughs> I love that. And I don't remember what that conversation was like. <laughs> so I kind of started being a sex educator at an early age. That is wonderful. But truly, I thought everybody got that. Oh. And so just through high school and then in college and different places realized that people didn't yeah. get that. And then I became a therapist, a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor. And I started off in the field in play therapy, really. Wow, that's right. And, I remember. And doing a lot of filial therapy, teaching yeah. parents how to do relationship with, in a really healthy therapeutic way with yeah. kids and just loved that. 
And then just started working more and more with couples. And then more and more sex things started walking into my office. Totally. And the same thing, uh, when I speak and when I talk to clients, I always ask, well, what were you told about sexuality or were you given healthy? And here's what I find amazing. That people will often say, well, you know, Debbie, in the China, I'm Chinese in the Chinese culture. We, we just don't talk about sex. Well, you know, I'm Hispanic and in the Hispanic culture. I mean, you see it everywhere or Latino, but we don't talk about it in the house. You know, Debbie, we're from Zambia and we didn't talk about it. I have found that the one thing I believe cross-culturally, yeah. we don't teach healthy sexuality. No, no. And that's something that I'm hoping that in podcasts like this, yeah. in churches, that we get better Gosh, wouldn't that be of great? equipping young kids. Because yeah. if we talk about sex in a healthy way, mm-hmm. then people know how to set healthy boundaries Absolutely. and make wiser decisions sexually. Absolutely. Because there's so much responsibility and yes. empowerment that yes. comes with sex. Yes. But if not careful, there can be so much damage and destruction. Oh, my gosh. I love that you and I come from completely opposite perspectives on this topic. So and share yet, with me well, yours. Yeah, like I grew up in a family where nobody talked about sex. Okay. As a matter of fact, I remember apparently me and my sixth grade friends walking home from school, the topic came up. And when I got home, uh, apparently another mother had called my mother. Oh. And I got my butt chewed. Oh. Like, you will never talk about sex. Oh, even just amongst your friends? With your friends ever again. Don't you ever shame me like that again. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And then I grew up in a home where there was, you know, there was incest. And so all of that was just Mm. so dark, so shameful. And nobody ever said a word. Mm. Right so that's the home I grew up in. Right. And, and if it's not yeah. spoken about, again, oh. it, it suggests it is too shaming to speak yeah. about. And then yeah. you were shamed and then oh, just felt like causing shame. Like, buckets Whoa. of shame uh, around sex. So sorry. Yeah, I know. Beginning. It was just, you know, and then had a sexual assault from a youth pastor when I was 17. So we just come from like your experience and my experience. And you know, isn't it cool? Here we are in the, kind of the same place. And same thing happened to me. I became a licensed professional counselor. And then my office filled up. One day I had eight clients. Seven of them had sexual trauma. Mm. Wow. And so at the end of the day, I'm just kind of Seven like, of eight. Seven of eight. And maybe I was different as a therapist, probably like you were, because I would ask people like, hey, tell me about the sexual part of your life. Mm -hmm. And people would start telling you, and maybe they had been to four or five other therapists and nobody had ever asked them. And here underneath the surface, they had all of this sexual trauma. And men and women. And so that's how I ended up at the Institute for Sexual Wholeness, where we both got our certification as sex therapists, right? Yes. Yeah. So 20... Oh, Lord. 11, something like that, 2009? Yeah, I actually started earlier, and then I uh, got really sick with lupus and had to kind of take a pause. So, but yeah, I finished it all in, I don't know, 2010, 2011. I think it was 2011 when I finished the other three or four courses that I needed to finish. So I'd gotten started, though, probably... You started before me. I, I started, started in 2005 and finished 2008, and you'd started before me. Yeah, I think I started in 2003 or four. Yeah. 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 So, girl, it was a journey for me to get it all completed, but we did it. Isn't that fascinating, though? I mean, as we talk about how different our journeys are, but yes. landed on the same passions. I know. For, for various know. reasons. Yes. But the main reason is we want people to have oh, an experience healthy sexuality. I remember thinking as a, like, 16-year-old, like, Am I supposed to navigate all this all by myself? Hmm. Am I hmm. supposed to make all these decisions all by myself? And I looked around and I'm like kind of like, yep. Yep. You're all you're on your own, girlfriend. Yeah. And I'm like, oh Lord, help me. <laughs> you know? 
that's a lot for a 16 year old to carry. Oh my gosh. Well, actually I was, I, I think that's when I had my awareness. I think it was more like, I remember going to seventh grade. That's when junior high started back then. And like all these eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade boys were now asking me out. And I'm like, Oh, what do I do with this? Wow. You know, yeah. like, and I like boys. Yeah. And yeah. So it's, yeah. it's just a lot to navigate on your own. It is a lot to yeah, navigate on your own. And, you know, when you think about, gosh, our prefrontal cortex isn't developed until we're 25. So we sex therapists say that all of us need a lot of sexual guidance. Yes. And I mean, I think we always do, but especially until we're 25. We need some grown-up adults helping us right. make good decisions. Yeah. So it's like, no wonder we make a lot of... <laughs> you know, and no I'm wonder wise. like kids like me can make yeah. some... Uh, maybe it wasn't my best decision. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not the most protective No, decision. protective? I, that yeah. wasn't even a word. Well, especially since I'd already been violated right. by my father, who was supposed to be the one I could... Who was supposed, supposed to be to, the one who would protect me. Yes. And he wasn't protective at all. He was violating. And so then that all gets really screwed up inside yeah, of you. Does. You know? So, yeah. So I know you've got two passions you've really focused on. I mean, I know you you do kind of any on all the things when mm -hmm. it comes to sex therapist. But over the years, you've developed two big passions. What are those? One of my passions is truly, as we are talking about, yeah. is really equipping parents to yes. talk to their kids about sex. I love to do that, too. And and so that's an outside of the therapist office. It's inside the therapist. But, I mean, I just love getting yeah. to speak in churches or women's retreats yeah. or couples retreats. So just speaking on talking to your kids about healthy sexuality from the young ages all the way and, you know, Again, to going off on that wedding day. Night, yeah. Let's keep that conversation out there and totally. prepare people well. You yeah. Know? So that that's one of my passions in that. And then another passion is truly working with uh, couples who have done a sexual pain journey. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of work with women who yeah. experience sexual pain. Yeah. And that that's physical pain. A lot of times when I say that, experience sexual pain, people mean, oh, like you mean trauma emotional pain and I'm like no I mean physical pain yes. excruciating pain in yes. sex yes and um there's it's way more prevalent mm. and those women it, it seems that it permeates every part of their life and then for the couples yeah. that are doing that journey together for the men there's so much isolation and shame and loneliness and feelings of rejection and women feel shame and they feel guilty and they get messages from the church that to be godly wives they need to be having sex with their husbands mm -hmm. or um so they feel that they're not being godly or not being yeah. a good wife oh. and then so they have all this guilt and shame and then yeah. the men feel rejected or they start making attribution she's just not sexual enough or she's not attracted to me and so the tension and the build up, the conflict, it begins to permeate everything. Oh. Yes. Uh, why is it that that, that what, what started that culture of, of teaching bad and giving these false narratives to, to women so they have to be on those expectations? It's mm. a good question. If you don't mind, could you just say it in the mic? Because I don't have a microphone. Okay. So, you know, there has been faulty teaching in the church. For sure. Uh, that puts pressure, um, I think it's it's misguided teaching of Scripture yeah. that's been somewhat distorted. For sure. And, and you know, when I speak of the church, um, I'm not attacking or criticizing the church. No. I'm part of the church. Yeah, me too. I'm part of the bride yeah, of Christ. Yeah, we love it. We love the church. And if we can't own yeah. that we've not done some things well yeah. and that we, we've done some things in a really unhealthy way, yeah. then we can't be safe. No. And, and I think we, we need to create healthier, safer churches yeah. and, and correct some misteaching. I so. But I, I know one of the passages in Scripture in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 7, and it's 3 through 9, mm -hmm. is where it talks about that uh, our bodies as women don't belong just to us. They, they belong to our husbands. Mm -hmm. But the husband's body doesn't belong just to him. It also belongs to the wife. Mm -hmm. 
And it says that we are to serve one another. Yeah. But it but it's meaning outside the bedroom as well as inside the bedroom. Totally. I love the way the message Bible says yeah. it. It says it like um the bedroom is a place to serve one another. Yeah. And I'm like in mutuality. Yes. And this it, it's meant to be this beautiful sweetness. Yes. Why is it that gotten so misconstrued and used to beat women up? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I guess we'd have to go back historically yeah. through patriarchy. All the, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, it got twisted somewhere oh, along man. the way. Big and time. then and then it's the kind of the one area though that we go, okay, men, you're to be Christ like and who Christ was safe. For women. Yeah. But it's like when it comes to sexuality in marriage, it's like all of a sudden we almost like, well, in this area, though, it can't be this mighty warrior and fight up and and all It's You're going to need sex. I mean, you know, and if you don't have it, my goodness, you need to make sure the woman you're married to provides that. I mean, it's like all of a sudden we take godly character out of that. Totally. Something loving. Yes. (laughs) Versus staying mindful. Yeah. of God being the designer of sex, and he's mm-hmm. the one that created us as women yeah. so uniquely different from men. And I just love that. Yeah. Now, the differences are complicated, but I, I well, do they love are. that we're different. And, you know, sometimes I think it's so fascinating that, you know, we know so much more than we used to because of neuroscience. And, and what the research I've done says that actually our brains are 99% alike. So, you know, there's all this thinking that, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. You know, there's some truth to that because we are 1% different. And I think a lot of times where you see the difference is like men when they're younger, not Mm -hmm. always when, when they're older, things change for men sexually. But when they're younger, men have like a super, supersonic highway. Like Mm -hmm. there's five, six lanes, you know, and they (laughs) just go places fast. And females have more of a meandering pathway. You know, we, uh-huh. we, we want to take the country road mm-hmm. that's lovely and there's some scenery and we can take it all in mm-hmm. and it includes all of our senses. Yes. And there's beautiful fields of flowers and maybe some lovely homes to look at along the way or fields of horses. And, you know, we're, we're, that's more us. We're not on this supersonic highway, mm-hmm. you know. And maybe we don't mind getting derailed because that's just more to see. Exactly. Oh, oh. new experiences. Yeah, and I love the idea from Dr. Basson that, you know, females definitely, once we've been in a relationship for or had a baby, mm-hmm. you know, and been in that relationship for three, four years, that we go from probably our sexuality when we first are with a man looks a little more like a man, yeah. where it's like, ooh, la la, I want you, baby, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And then we get into long-term relationships or have some kids. And then we slip more into sexual neutrality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think sometimes the man can feel like, oh, what happened? To, where'd she go? Mm-hmm. Where'd the ooh-la-la go? Yeah. And even she can be like, dang, what's happened to me? Like, yeah, where is... I remember, <laughs> I think I was vacuuming and had... Vacuuming the house because, you know, I have four little boys... And had a kid on my hip and vacuuming with the other hand. And I just had this moment of like, yeah, where did the ooh la la go? Right. We're, we're sexy. <laughs> Ain't <laughs> no sexy nowhere. I think I got barf on one shoulder. And this diaper probably needs changing. And I'm vacuuming up the Cheerios for the fifth time today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like, there ain't no sexy anywhere. Mm-hmm. I'd be glad. I'd be happy for a shower right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and a nap. And, and a nap. <laughs> and not have spit up on me. I mean, right? Or or somebody pulling on me or, you know, right. breastfeeding or breast milk leaking or, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it was just messy. Right. <laughs> you right. know? And, and so that's where our sexuality starts looking mm-hmm. quite a bit different. Mm-hmm. And where, you know, I, I remember in those days, like, Ron and I would make love, and I'm like, oh, that was nice. We should do that more often, right? Yeah. And it was like, but I had to find a first gear. Right. Because you can just get in sexual neutrality, mm-hmm. and that's where foreplay comes in. 
Yeah, so it's needed. Side note, sorry, yes. that was a side note. Let's go back to the pain you have heard about. Because it's interesting, you've had a lot of that walk through your door. I haven't had a lot, as much of that walk through my door. Right. Isn't that interesting? It is so interesting. And so God's put me kind of like on a different path than he has for you. But I really care about women who sure. suffer sexual pain like right. physical, sexual, it hurts. Right. And so I have a ton of empathy for that. But you're, that's more your specialty than it is mine. So tell us more. You know, it just started walking into my office. And again, I know I'm one practice in among, you know, a ton of practices in the DFW sure. area. Yeah. And, there, and there's several of us sex therapists in this area. But um, for some reason, I it was just walking in my office. Yeah. You know, I, I guess... You know, I do believe a little bit like the movie, if you build it, they will come. If yeah. God gives us knowledge of something or a little bit of wisdom's been dropped there in life, he's like, I'm going to need you to use that. Yeah. And so going through the Institute for Sexual Wholeness, um, I remember after going through the courses on dysfunction and pain, mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I think I've had a couple of women mention yeah. sexual pain, but yeah. they just started coming in. And so yeah. I just started asking them, yes. uh, have you ever spoken to another woman that's had pain? And they were like, no, never. Mm. I was like, well, if I if I put a group together, would you come? They were like, oh, well, I said that enough to eno- enough of the women. I love yeah. it when clients call you out. Uh, one of the women finally said to me, said, Debbie, you keep talking about these other women in a group. When are you going to start that group? Oh, I was like, oh, oh yeah. what are you doing? Thirsty a week, you know? Yeah. And just, I mean, literally invited 16 women mm-hmm. and 11 of those 16 women. Wow. Well, and it shows how many women are out there living in pain and in silence. Yes. Do these women get help from their gynecologists? Do they get any help from doctors? Where do they find help, Debbie? Good, good question. So one of the sad things is some of the most hurtful things they've been told have often been by their OB-GYNs. Oh, man. And just, you know, some male and some female that just don't understand pain. And yeah. we, we tend to think that ob are really, really trained in the sexuality and sexual functioning, and they're really not. No. I mean, they're trained in vaginas and knowing the anatomy. But when it comes to experiencing sexual pain, it really is a really complex. It's so complex. It is so complex. I remember our our, prof- our dearly beloved professor, Doug Rosenau, used to say, we've got to stop a simplistic, what was it? Uh, okay, simplistic humanism uh, re- reducing humanity, reducing our sexuality to the simplest of terms. Right. In other words, this is complex. It is complex. And women don't just have vaginal pain. They can also have pain, vulva pain. Right. They can have pain on the outside, on the inside. Yeah. Right? I I, I kind of break it down in this that in that this is just helpful and explain it. There can be tissue issues. Yep. I mean, really that there's problem with, with tissue lining. There yes. can be muscle issues yes. uh, referred to as kind of the hypertonic pelvic floor or what was always referred to as vaginismus before that yep. really the, the muscles contract in such a way that it makes the, it, it's impossible for the penis to enter. Right. And it's painful upon every attempt and they Ugh. just keep trying and trying and trying, oh, you know, yes. uh, there can be nerve, uh, issues yes. where either there's been nerve damage or scar tissue yeah. uh, um, in the vulva area and mm-hmm. the labia area. I mean, it, there there can be the the nerve issues, mm-hmm. and then there certainly can be the medical issues. Yes. You know, fibroids, uh, um, endometriosis, those things that really are diagnosable that cause uh, intercourse to be very painful. Very painful. And you know, in the when I offered this group for the very first time and these 11 women shown up. It was just so interesting. Most all of them started with, I found out that sex was going to be painful on, on our wedding night. Aww. You know, I was raised Christian and virginity was held really high. And so uh, I was a virgin or I was Hindu and Hindu and, and Hindu mm-hmm. beliefs virginity is held really high. Well, mm-hmm. we're Jehovah Witness and I was a virgin because Jehovah Witness for oh, us, yeah. virginity is held really high. Right. So it kind of was a, uh, the Muslim women, virginity is held very high. Oh, yeah. So again, cross-culturally, they had a lot of the same message, mm-hmm. but not any preparing Mm-mm. or 
any indication that sex might be painful. Mm. So you can only imagine these couples start feeling pretty duped by God. Totally. You know, we've been told it's wonderful gifts. You set boundaries. You know, again, all these things that we may say in church that aren't really healthy teaching that no. if you do it God's way, it'll be simple and easy and wonderful. Get sexual Which none paradise. of life is like that outside of no, life. You know? It's so dumb. It's so, <laughs> could we stop being so dumb? Yes. Could we, we just to. stop being dumb yeah. and stop being weird and stop promising all these youth group teenagers that if you wait, you're going to have sexual paradise. We guarantee it. Yeah. And I'm like, that is a lie. You cannot guarantee that. And there's a lot more ingredients that go into a healthy sex life right. besides waiting. Right. People. Or just parts coming together and fitting together. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yes. It's a little more complex. Yeah. The vulnerability and the relationship oh and gosh. the interaction. Learning and how to share your body. And, and knowing your body. I mean, most women. Don't know their body. We don't know our body. I'm like, girls, you got to. I mean, guys, you know, every time they go pee, they're touching their penis. Yeah. They know that thing. I know it. They know you're with it. They know it. Yeah. (laughs) All right? Yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) Hello, best friend. They know. and, And, but females, and you know, they say research shows, right, that even, um, you know, little, I had four little boys. They, you change your diapers and they're grabbing themselves. Yeah. Right? Little girls touch themselves, and little girls typically get their hands slapped. Yeah. And mama says, don't you touch that. Somehow it's nasty. Dirty. Oh, my. Don't do that. Gosh. Isn't that crazy? Told her, it's so nasty. I'm like, what is that? And so females can just grow up thinking, that's bad. It's dirty. It's, I mean, I've even heard some women say, it, it's stinky. It's, I mean, all these horrible things. I'm like, oh, sweet girl, that is... So not true. And I can't remember yes, what. Yes, Hector. Sorry. <laughs> Go That's ahead. Right. If I get annoying, please stop. No, no, no. no we love you. Now. Jump so, in. Uh, the ladies who have walked in with, with pain down there, uh-huh. yeah. have you noticed, did you see any displays of their mental health start to like dwindle, like with depression? Mm. Sure. Feeling inadequate? Oh, like, oh walk, yes. Walk us through, through that. Right. So certainly women who experience sexual pain, they, you know, first they feel the first thought for them is something is wrong with me. me. I so mean, shame. Something is wrong with yeah. me uh, that I'm not functioning or what have I done? Or maybe they were trying to do it right along the way and they cross sexual boundaries. So now they're beating themselves up, you know, guilty, like this is a punishment from God oh. that I'm experiencing this because oh. I didn't maintain the, the boundaries oh. well. Or they may feel, again, spiritually duped. And so now there's this, something's wrong with me. Can I really trust God or have I offended him? Is he mad at me? And then when it begins to create the tension in the relationship and they've got husbands saying things to them like, you know, you just don't desire me. Maybe you're just not sexual enough. You don't, um, you'll, you'll, you'll never be as sexual as I am. Uh, something's wrong, you're you're just trying to avoid me. They start all these attributions. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they become feeling inadequate. Uh, They have shame. They feel it's got to be secret. Because, you know, so many of these couples come home off their honeymoon and everybody's like, oh, how was the honeymoon? And they're like, it's okay. And feeling so much shame that they weren't able to consummate on their honeymoon. So many of the women do fight a lot of depression totally. and or it's created an anxiety. Yeah. Like, will this ever end? Is it always going to hurt? We keep trying. And, and that is the thing also is we don't prepare couples at all well enough that sex could be painful. And I think we don't want to create a fear. Right. But right. the possibility it might could be. Yeah. I always want new yeah. brides if they've not been sexual. Yeah. Uh, any part of their life, I want them to go to an OB-GYN for a pelvic floor exam, mm-hmm. for uh, a pap smear, mm-hmm. so they can know and experience it, you know, if they can if, if they can be examined and not experience pain, yeah. they're probably going to be okay. Yeah. But if yeah. they do experience pain, that's something to tend to prior to, yeah. not just discovering it on their wedding night. Well, and don't you think that, I mean, I never look forward 
to those kind of OB exams. That, <laughs> I mean, do you? Like the it, the spectrum you thing? You so surprise me, Nancy. I you don't. don't look forward I, to that. I mean. I've never heard a woman go, I love my pep smear morning. I, I mean. <laughs> I well, I mean, that. they put this cold metal thing up inside of you and expand yes. you. And, and so. While your legs are in stirrups uh-huh. and you're spread legged. And it's. It's it's very awkward and and not like being sexually aroused and having something inserted, right. but you're right. It's it's both and. It's like so this isn't going to be pleasant right. or comfy, right. and you may discover that if it's really painful, if it's painful, and there's a difference between uncomfortable and painful, right? And if this is painful, then we may need to explore that and normalize that, that that can happen. Right. Because many women have been told maybe sex for the first time will be painful. Yeah. We need to say uncomfortable. Yeah. Awkward. Yeah. But when we say painful, then when they experience pain, they go, oh, this is normal. I was told that this would be painful. Yeah. So they keep trying and trying. That, when they experience excruciating pain. That is not normal. That's not normal. No. And to just keep trying that and trying that. No. Now they're conditioning their body that this is painful. This yes. is excruciating. Yes. And I don't like this. I don't want this. Their whole body starts tensing up. Totally. And the, you know, I, it's, it's, ju- it's, it's very traumatizing, I oh, think, for many so women. Oh, it's so traumatizing. And the husband, when that happens on a honeymoon. Both of them. Yeah. And can just then cloud the relationship and feelings of inadequacy and shame. For both parties. Both of them. You know. And it, it's so sad. And then I, I know you are aware of this with all yeah. that you do too, that maybe not specializing in pain, but I know you've worked with many couples who've been impacted by porn. Yeah. And, and, and I, we just live in a, there's none of us that have not been impacted by porn. We're in a porn. pornified so, world. Exactly. Yep. So, you know, then we have these young couples coming in that they've been exposed to porn pretty much most of their lives. Yeah. Since so, so about six, eight, ten. Yeah. You know. And so they have these certain expectations, yes. and most men, although they may be, be very familiar with their bodies, they really don't know a woman's body. No. You know, because porn's not real helpful on helping us understand healthy sexual education, that what a yes. wife may need, right. what a woman may need right. for buildup and arousal. Right. And so the males start comparing with what they think this is supposed to be like. Yeah. But then they feel rejected yeah. in this, or then they do begin. What's wrong with me? No, what's wrong with her? Yes, she's and not performing like the porn stars I have been raised on. Truly, if we are intact with relationship and yeah. intimacy, that's not a way that you believe. I mean, at the core, innately, to treat another human. Yeah, right. And it, it's only after it gets paired. I think viewing in, um, th- there's not a really personal relationship where we're watching it. Yeah. But now our arousal template is now set with that. It, exactly. And there has to be some disassociating going on. Yes. For men. Yeah. To stay present with the woman that they love. Yes. To be able to treat one like that, or. It's the opposite effect. Yeah. They can't be aroused by the woman that they love. And they don't know how to perform with her because they have all these messages of what that's to be like. And they really know they don't want to do this right. to the woman they that love. they love. Yes, there's so much. You, well, you and I have both worked with a lot of sex addicts, sexual addiction, mm-hmm. sexual um, issues. and And historically how people who are really, I'm not talking about casual porn, occasional use, but we're talking about more like daily, habitual, pure yeah, pure, pure sexual addiction, pornography addiction, that they eventually stop making love to their spouse. Mm-hmm. And it is because they, they've gotten attached to these images and to this is what's been normalized. This is how you have sex. Mm-hmm. And so... It doesn't translate to a real human. Yes, Hector. Yeah. Have you ever, have either of you ever had a client where they actually fell in love with someone on the screen? Like idolized them and were in love with them? I hear a lot about that. Yes. Mm-hmm. I would love to hear about that. I have. Because I, when I was a pastor at a church, I did. You got to reiterate. Sorry. Okay. 
Oh, oh, okay. Hector. Hector asked the question is, have either one of us had clients who actually fell in love with a porn star? Wow. And and kind of develop an obsession with them and that's their fantasy life is wrapped around this porn star. And I was saying that um, when I was a pastor at a church, um, I did uh, several conferences on human sexuality. And um, one of the guys who'd been in the recovery group that I ran came up to me and said, I don't know what to do. This former female porn star is actually here today. Because huh. I had somebody come in from the wow. porn industry. Yeah. A woman who had been in the porn industry, right. and he said, she's here, and I'm freaking out. She was my 24-hour fantasy. Wow. wow. And I don't know what to do right now. Wow. Wow. So I'm Nancy, like. Nancy, how'd you answer him? Well, I said, hey, you know, number one, let's just normalize us. I'm sure this happens to a lot of people. You attach to those images, mm -hmm. and you think you know that person. You know, and we're just attaching damages. And um, I said, so you're needing containment right now. Mm -hmm. So let's get four or five of your buddies. Mm -hmm. Let's go find them. Because you got a lot of your guys who are in the group with right. you are here. Let's go get them. And let's make sure that they're going to be with you and yes. help you walk this out and be contained. Right. Because he was losing it. Yeah, can't do it alone. No, oh, you can't do this. Man, none of us can do this alone, Dad. Mm -hmm. no. I love that. That's why, like, you and I are big believers in groups. Like, you start a group for women yes. who are having sexual pain, and then you started, you'd start a group for their hobbies. Yeah, we, we got, got it started, and then it, two other therapists were going to kind of continue it, and it just never quite took off. Oh, okay. But I... I I believe there's some reasons for that. I yeah. do believe men, if it were offered, would do a group mm -hmm. for uh, men who, or their spouses have sexual pain. Yeah. Because yeah. It, they, Satan works in isolation. Oh, you know that. man. And the thoughts they get in their head, oh, yeah. the, the things they say about themselves, the yeah. things they attribute to their spouse. Yeah. Those things need to be processed out and with other people to come back to who is this you love and yeah. you know that she loves you and yeah. what are tender ways to come on this journey with her. Yeah. And what if we can't have intercourse right now? What are all the other ways that y'all can still choose to make love? Yeah. Which that's what I love helping couples with is that. I love that too. The, what is the saying that we've got to quit privileging <clears throat> pena, uh, penis vagina uh, intercourse is if that's the only way to make love. Totally. And recognizing all the other ways yeah. that couples can make love. I I mean, this is kind of a personal note. I hope it's not too personal. <laughs> but, like, I had uh, several years ago, like, I think four years ago, maybe five now, I had a huge fibroid tumor. Oh, my. And, and that caused, caused and I'm like, medical issues huh, that cause pain. Yeah, why is sex, sex becoming uncomfortable? And so I love that I knew that until we figured out what it was, because it took a little while yeah. um, to get that properly diagnosed. And, and, then I, and then I had to have a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And so as a sex therapist, I knew, like, honey, there's lots of ways for us to be sexual. Yes. And actually, it was, kind of, it was super fun. And creative, I bet. We got way creative. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's fun. We've never done that before. And, you know, for a couple who had, we'd been married like 45 years at that point. And to keep like discovering new fun ways to be yeah. sexual with each other yeah. was actually amazing. Oh, Hector. <laughs> okay, bud. What you got? So I would, whenever you're talking to clients, yeah. how do you explain to them these practical things? Because you're right. Most, okay. most people teach it's just penis, vagina, sex. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's yeah. What have you walked clients through practically on what they could start practicing with their spouse? Yeah. Wow. I love your questions, Hector. Hector's asking, how do we walk clients through uh, realizing there's a lot of other ways to make love besides just penis, uh, penis vagina. vagina intercourse? Right. I love that question. Yeah. And and we may go about this in, in different ways mm -hmm. and all, but I'm certain maybe some are very similar too. You know, I, I, I think 
we, we help couples see that, you know, we can have this big continuum that either says that sex, we, we demonize it. It's yes. awful. Stay away from it. You know, yes. uh, before marriage, it's, it's taboo. We can't even talk about it, set boundaries around it, but stay away from it. Almost like it's, it's this awful, bad, ugly thing to then, and we marry, we often put it on the other end and we deify it that, Right. You know, that's the, the best ever. The best is, thing in the world. Of course. And, yes, yes. And I think helping come to the middle of certainly intercourse is important. It's significant. But there may be times in our relationship that it's not possible for various reasons. Totally. And when we think of all the things that we want Couples to have some healthy boundaries around mm -hmm. when they are dating, if they're not ready to be sexual, mm -hmm. um, is all that build up and the arousal and the sensations. And we, we do want to help couples, you know, have some boundaries around that, but to delight in it. Yeah. You know, steward it well, but delight in it. Yeah, delight in it. But all that build up is necessary. Yeah. And we don't ever want to stop that engaging and caressing and being sensual with one another yeah. Yeah. after we marry. Yeah. And so what happens, I think, many couples just so get focused on us having intercourse that every kind of touch leads to intercourse when we forget all the buildup and the sensation. So I walk couples through just some really basic protocols of learning how to have that platonic touch yeah. Doug Rosenau called it the green type of touch yeah, yeah. and then he would refer he to colors. the sensual touch as yeah. the purple touch there could be different shades of purple yeah and then the erotic the orange yeah vibrant yeah. touch yeah and that all three of those types of touches are really important in so important I've had women come in and say gosh I used to be orgasmic and I'm not anymore I'm like, well, what's different? And they'll say, well, let me see. Huh. We've kind of just been having quickies in the morning before we go to work. And I'm like, so is there time for you to get warmed up and aroused? Is there foreplay? Because foreplay is core play. Mm -hmm. For it's You know, important. right? Yeah. It's vital. Like, I think I could be wrong. But in the Song of Solomon, it says, don't arouse love until you're ready. Right. Uh, now, I know some probably interpret it in one way. This is how Nancy interprets it. It's like, women, you don't have, don't even consider having intercourse until you're aroused. Until you're ready. Right. And, and just because a female's lubricated does not mean she's fully aroused. Right. And so arousal's huge. Mm -hmm. And that needs to include, like you said, like just platonic touch. Like it's so cute. We were with our grandkids this weekend and um, Ron and I were out in the yard swinging one of them and we just leaned over and gave each other a kiss. And she's like six and she's like, ew, ew, gross, gross, <laughs> gross. But, but we just, we're just affectionate throughout the day. Yeah. Like I love to go to church with Ron because he always puts his, like we hold hands mm -hmm. or he puts his arm around me. Right. Or I just kind of like rub his back, mm -hmm. you know, like we're just touchy feely, yeah. you know, with each other. And that's part of, of, I think that's a huge part of lovemaking. Yeah. Kind of foreplay throughout the day. Uh, all day. Why not? Like make it fun. Yeah. You know, and I think it keeps attachment alive, yes. you know, just touch when you think that attachment for infants is all touch mm -hmm. and Adults need attachment as desperately as infants do. Right, right. And so this touching, mm -hmm. caressing, being playful, little, so important. little pecks throughout the day. Mm -hmm. But then it's even like more than that, like for us, like expanding our repertoire of making love. Right. Besides intercourse, mm -hmm. which just ended up being like, well, let's get curious. Right. Let's be playful. Let's, you know, yeah. just try different things. Right. Which, coming to, I, I work on couples, too.
Because I'm a big believer that what happens inside the bedroom is going to flow yeah. inside the bedroom. And what we experience inside the bedroom is going to flow and impact what happens outside the bedroom. For sure. But if we can't be playful and fun yeah. outside the bedroom, yeah. we're not going to be able to be playful and fun inside the bedroom. No. And this is going to sound so silly, but I think I, I believe it's true. I think if we never quit skipping, yeah. that if we as adults still skipped, yeah. would take way less antidepressants, yeah. way less anti-anxiety, yeah. and way less uh, sleep medications. Right. Because you can't skip and not laugh. You can't yeah. skip and not have fun. Yeah. And my husband and I, we, we kind of accidentally did it, but we were on vacation one time, and I was just like, you want to skip with me? And we started skipping down the street. Before we knew it, people are stopping and laughing and hooting, and it we just – and we will break out skipping sometimes just in different cute. places, yeah. holding hands and being playful. And being playful. And we've never had kids. Yeah. So it's yeah. even when you see two adults skipping without kids attached, yeah. it's really kind of funny. Yeah, I bet. But that playfulness outside the bedroom it brings it into the helps bedroom. Helps for it to flow and come in. And don't you think couples, instead of normalizing that not every sexual encounter is going to be fireworks, it's not. I mean, they're, you know, sometimes you look at your spouse and go, well, I hope that was good for you. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes like I always say to women, like women, if you want an orgasm, it's kind of like you got to put on your Nikes and climb the hill. Right. It's not as automatic for females. And sometimes a woman may not want an orgasm. I know men don't get yeah. that. You know, at all. <laughs> right. Hector's chuckling right. over there like, no, yeah. a man would not get that. Yeah. But sometimes you just want to be close. Right, because right. because the connection piece yeah. and the oneness piece is as important as just the orgasm piece. It totally. Yeah. And so you can just be affectionate and sexual without having an orgasm mm -hmm. and just normalizing. Mm -hmm. And and so I think if we could bring more playfulness yeah. to our lives, to like some clients, I'm like, okay, your assignments this week, I want you to go play together. I don't care. Go bowling. I don't care what it is. Go for a bicycle ride. Last night, Ron and I went for a walk in the rain. And that was just... Lovely. That was just playful. This is fun. Right? It's fun. And we're it's like, needed. Yeah. And we're splashing each other. And it was just like... And then I noticed that was easy to then just bring into our bedroom last night. Right. Right. You know? Hector, you got another one for us, buddy. How have you taught... When, when there's a couple that comes to you... Yeah. Yeah. But the other just can't. What was it? They're just like, they're more frustrated sexually. Yeah. How have you got or guided them through that? Mm -hmm. well, that's a great question. How do you get them to be playful when one wants to be and one doesn't know how to be? Take that, Nancy. <laughs> Go with that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, girl. I was like, oh, we're passing that one to you. That is, man. You know what? I think some of that is our adaptive child mm -hmm. where you learned how to be over responsible mm -hmm. at such a young age mm -hmm. and you're living in your adaptive child, which is black and white, right or wrong, you know, be responsible. And that is not. Or be competitive and win. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. And it's like that. I had to break the. New, bad news here to you. That does not make for a fun sexual partner. It doesn't. And so I think there needs to be some work done on, on okay, what's going on? What, what went on in your life as a child that you had to adapt to whatever was going on in your circumstances and you're mm -hmm. a brilliant little kid and you adapted. But in the process, you became overly serious, mm -hmm. overly responsible, um, everything's black, white, right, wrong, a competition. And, and how can we help you move into more like your wise adult mm -hmm. that can handle nuances yeah. and be playful and be relaxed and you're not carrying the world on, on your shoulders, right. you know? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes when Ron and I are maybe a little pissy with each other, um, you know, I've got this this <laughs> baker. I don't know. Do you guys not do that? Or am I the only one who's married and you get a little pissy? Um, oh, yeah. I've got this baker's rack over here in my my neck. And I'll just go, okay, I'm putting that all on the shelf. 
And I'm going to go back to our bedroom and make love to my husband. And go. my annoyance is, you'll be there when I come out if I want him. Right. But a lot of times, you know, I'll come out of our room and I'm like, hmm, I can't remember why I was so annoyed with him. Right. And like sex can, being sexual together, right. with or without intercourse, right. can help release feel-good hormones. Absolutely. That then smooth and soothe right. the relationship. So you just, you, that's a great example of where one of my passions is wanting women to come back to the empowerment yes. of their sexuality. Me too. Because we're just such in this big thing of, is it duty sex or, you know, don't do it unless you feel like it, unless you have desire or whatever. But I think sometimes instead of waiting for desire to lead us, it's what you just talked about. Decision led you. Yes. I decide to set this on the shelf. Yep. And I'm going to decide to go in there and make love to my husband. I'm going to decide that that is good for me. Oh, girlfriend. And it may not even yes. be out of your desire. No. But it's the decision to move forward and do it. Yes. And then yes. you feel you're, one, you're empowered in your sexuality and confident that I so want women to feel me that too. and experience. I it wrote a little book on that because you, I just. It's a great I, book. I just wanted to empower women. Yes. Like s women. Sex is for you. It, you. No, you're not servicing anybody. Right. Like, let's put our servicing yeah. ideas away. Gross. I mean, yes. you know, like anything we have to do, we don't want to do. One, one of my favorite stories with um, talking about sex sort of as family, and my family was used to it. Ryan's family was not. <laughs> but my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, he had gone on a fishing trip with Ryan one time, and he yeah. caught like a 30-pound salmon. Yeah. And Elmo would love telling that story. He said, ah, just seeing that smile on Ryan's face, I've just never seen Ryan smile, smile like that. And I leaned forward one day, and I said, Elmo, I can make Ryan smile like that. There you go. Right. And he just flushed with red, <laughs> and he didn't know what to do with that setback. And right. it's like... But I love it that I can. Yeah, I know. I know I've got a power like Ex that with my husband. Absolutely. And I love it. Absolutely. And I just want women to feel empowered by that. I do too. So I'm going to come back, though, to women in pain. Yes. Yes, that, please do. Again, it doesn't have to be about intercourse. No. I do believe that women and you know, this is why I love women getting together in group because so many of the things that women begin saying about themselves negatively yeah. because they're in, in struggling, you know, they yeah. feel they're in conflict with their vaginas and they feel like it's not functioning, it's not responding mm. right, or their body's turned against them. Mm. And they start with all these just self-deprecating and uh. self-loathing kind of statements. Yeah. And I'll look at them and go, Judy, would you say that to Patty? Yeah. You know, and they're like, yeah. no, I would never say no, that. But I'd... you've gotten real comfortable at saying that about yeah, yourself. Yeah, right. Like, I, yes. Like, but then being able so to good. change some of those thoughts. Right. Then right. that they can come back to feeling a little bit more confident. Yes. In their sexuality and that what they can bring to their husbands, even if it's not intercourse yet. Oh, for sure. And I, I love doing that journey with women. I do too, Debbie. I, I love seeing women empowered. Yes. You know, it's so easy in the world we're living in to either, you know, you know, we tend to, the pendulum swings. Mm -hmm. And so we can tend to go to one side where we're just bitter and like, forget that and I'm done with it. Right. Or we can go over to the other side where we can feel like we've been victimized, sure. even by our own, maybe by our own anatomy. Right. You know. And so, yeah, to start changing those messages, mm -hmm. like, When's the last time, women, you like, God, thank you for my amazing clitoris. Mm -hmm. You know, I love, I love clitoracy. Yeah. I love educating <laughs> women on, and men. Yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of what the book, the right. little book was about. Like, God has given you this amazing right. instrument. And yes. really, the clitoris is a, a mirror image of the penis, or really vice versa. Yeah. Because first, we, we look like females in vitro. Then the penis drops down. But this clitoris, it has 8,000 nerve endings mm -hmm. at least. And the clitoris is more like a wishbone. It's not just this little nub, teeny pencil head. Mm -hmm. 
It's no, it's like a wishbone, and it has much as much erectile tissue in the vulva as a penis, right. as a penis does. Yep. So I think we females we need a lot of education, right. and males they, males need to be educated on female yes. anatomy, yeah. and why the clitoris is so important. When you understand that, then you realize like orgasm mostly comes through clitoral stimulation, mm-hmm. and you don't need intercourse for clitoral right. stimulation right like lots of things can give you clitoral stimulation sure, sure. <laughs> you know and again for women who experience pain with intercourse yeah. begin to only associate negative feelings with being sexual yeah and when i can walk couples through if she's not learned to orgasm yet yeah or just giving them permission is, to work at orgasm. It is a skill for women to learn. It is often for women. It, it's a pretty. It's automatic for males, but it's it's not for females. It's really not. No, there's a lot of our brain power. Totally. Relaxation. Yes. Oh, if you're uptight, I mean, I think that's why females need foreplay because you're taking your brain. Females have very busy brains. Yes, we do. I've always said I wanted to invent a blue pill for females, and it's not. Viagra, it's like, shh, yeah, yeah, shut, it's shut, a quiet, the, yeah, shh. <laughs> What's all the noise in the head? <laughs> it's the quiet pill. Everything goes quiet. You know, but that's why you need foreplay. Because dopamine. when a man starts kissing you, he releases dopamine into your system. Mm-hmm. The dopamine helps start quieting the brain. Mm-hmm. And then the woman can go, oh. Like if women wait for desire to drive us, we ain't going to have hardly I, any sex. I think so. We Nancy, eat. I think that's so true. We're all going to start thinking, I must be asexual because I ain't got no desire. It's like, no, it's just we have to, you know, in, in the Song of Songs, she says, blow north wind, mm. <laughs> blow south wind. <laughs> She's like, come on, yeah. <laughs> something <Yeah>. happen, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> you know? And she also kind of goes, if. These things are in place, or if, if. The, you know, it's like, huh, there's a lot of ifs I might need to figure out here I know. to let my brain shut down. Oh, Lord. The brain is the biggest sexual organ. I know. And people just, they, they don't understand. They don't no, they that. don't. No. no, they don't. They, yeah. So, well, you devil, know, I, yeah, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I'm thinking that might be a, a podcast we want to do just we an do. adult sex education. Like, let's just walk. Let's men and do. women through some healthy educating about their Let's anatomy. Yes. And um, because, again, coming back to porn, porn does not at all teach healthy concepts about anatomy or what's needed no. for buildup and sensation or connection. Totally. You know, and, and yeah. then for women, women that have been exposed to porn, I find what often they do is they, they think, that's how I'm supposed to be. That's how I'm yes. supposed to act. That's how I'm supposed to sound. That's what I'm supposed to look like. So they get in performance mode, and they're not even paying attention to their body no. to know what build up to orgasm feels like because they're in performance oh. mode. Not, not yeah. you know, it's not even taking that they're thinking that their husbands are saying that they ought to be this way. They've now taken it on totally that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. That's right. And they miss it. It, it does. Themselves. It. I think it. You and I both have this passion because it breaks our heart. You know, God created us for knowing, yeah. to be known and to know, mm-hmm. and He created us for this beautiful intimacy with Him, and with our spouse. Yeah. And porn is the opposite of knowing. It's actually an unknowing. It's mm-hmm. it's a disassociation. I'm not actually going to make love with you. And bring you my body and share our bodies together. Mm-hmm. It's this total disassociation. Mm-hmm. I'm actually with an image, but I'm acting out on you. Mm-hmm. Or I'm actually acting out what some other female porn star look like, and that's what I'm supposed to look like. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, y'all, that's not making love. Mm-mm. And I really long for... Every couple to have the sweetness right. of love making. I think that's what God was like. Hey, if you're gonna be married, mm-hmm. <laughs> you need this sweet gift. Mm-hmm. 
of making love to each other. Mm-hmm. And if you have sexual pain, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like I read a report recently that 30 million American men are suffering from erectile dysfunction. So, you know, we talk about female pain, but men have right. sexual pain. I think when mm-hmm. a, a man is struggling with erectile dysfunction, that's sexual pain for him. Sure. Or pyronies. There's some there's sexual mm-hmm. pain for men. There is sexual pain for men. Yeah, too. there is. And so for us to have empathy right. for our p- sexual partner, mm-hmm. for us to be kind and compassionate, and like, well, mm-hmm. how can we love each other in this season? Mm-hmm. How can we be kind and compassionate and and still f- battle? I mean, this is just me, and I'm be, I might be off base here, but I believe that when I said I do to Ron when I was 18 years old, mm-hmm. that I was saying I do to being your sexual partner mm-hmm. for all the days of our lives, right. whatever that looks like, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And whatever that looks like. Mm-hmm. And so whatever we're going through sexually, Right. If if we'll remain in a place of grace and love and kindness mm-hmm. and putting sex on the front burner, mm-hmm. like we're not going to neglect this, we're going to fight for it because we need the feel-good hormones. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe it's so just that us. bonding and connection. We, we need the feel-good hormones to have a pleasant marriage together. Yeah. Like we, maybe, I don't know, maybe we're two little twerps. I don't know, but you know what I mean? Like, we need that. I think that's God's gift to us. And he said, you guys, you're going to need this. Mm -hmm. So I want to say, and then I want to ask you, I want to say to everybody listening today, if you're married, like, value this. Right. Please. And if it's not going well, Mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to have times where it's not going well. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. Don't awfulize it. Don't catastrophize it. You're going to have sexual ups and downs. Sometimes it'll be really sweet and good, and sometimes it'll be like, this just sucks. Right. And that's okay. Right. And stay committed mm-hmm. to working it out. Right. Can't ignore it. Yep. And I, I, I think we do the two extremes. We either get ourselves so busy, we say yes to so many things so we can oh, say right. no to this. Yep. Cause Oh, we're so busy, busy, busy. And we're fatigued from being so busy, busy, busy. And fatigue is one of the number one desire killers for women. Totally. You know? Well, I think for men, too. Probably so. Ugh. Exhausting. Yeah. The, but they, we, we stay in this busyness yeah. and or yeah. we get lazy. Yeah. We, we, we want it to be easy, and because it's not, mm-hmm. we're just too lazy to work on it. And, and I just think we, we, it's, too, it's too significant. It's not the most important thing, no. but it's a significant thing. I think it's a piece. And it's something that we just can't ignore. Yeah. And you know what? I, I love how you're so vulnerable about your journey mm-hmm. that you, you chose to reclaim that oh, man. area of your, your sexual life to be something to in, be yeah. enjoyed. I had to fight for that, Deb. I know you did. Because there were times when I was walking through all, all the sexual trauma I had where Ron and I would be making love, and I'm like, all of a sudden, like, he's the monster. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. He feels like this male monster right now, and he is the man I love. Mm-hmm. How are we going to work this out? Mm. And so we got to a place where I could kind of, like, tap him. Right. <laughs> We're in the middle of making love. Yeah. I'd, I'd tap on him, and yeah. he knew that meant stop. stop. Mm. And then he had just hold me and pray over me Mm. and say, babe, I love you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, from the world I came from where there was just taking from my body and I didn't have a voice for me to be able to have a man who would just stop. Mm. I mean, he's got an erection he's having, you know what I mean? And he just stops and like, no, you're more important to me than having an orgasm. Tended to you. Right? And he just held me and prayed for me and loved on me. And neither one of us really knew what to do, but that's what we would do. Mm. And then I'm like, oh, I'm so safe. How sweet. Because really, if Mm. a couple don't have safety, Mm -hmm. 
Like if if one of them's super critical towards the other one, or one of them's shaming towards the other one, you know, or like I've heard of women like yelling at their husbands because they're having erectile dysfunction, you know, and and then men also shaming their wives because maybe they do have pain, and that does not create any safety. It does not. And if we're going to really make love to each other, we've got to have safety and mm-hmm. trust. And mm-hmm. I know you've done a lot of work around betrayal, so have mm-hmm. I. I mean, gosh, some couples just go through some of the hardest things, Deb. They do. And, it, you know, what I would say for both couples that do a pain journey together yeah. and for couples who do a recovery from betrayal journey yes. together, I do believe that those couples develop a greater capacity they do for a deeper intimacy than some other couples will ever know because it is truly almost like we've gone through hell and back yes we, we we've been to the the worst of the worst whether yes. excruciatingly uh, physically painful or emotionally painful yes and now we've done the journey together and they and they th- these couples uh, I call them courageous and and strong Oh, me too. That they had, they just develop a yeah. deep, deep, deep capacity for intimacy. I experienced that, Deb. Like when I was at the church I was at, I started an affair recovery program. Mm-hmm. And man, those couples, now yeah. not all of them made it and right. not all of them should have made it. Right. You know, there was just so much water under that bridge. Mm-hmm. And I get that. But, man, I'm telling you, like those that did, which was a high percentage of recovery, Uh I think our statistics were at least 90% recovered. Mm -hmm. They became my most powerful marriage volunteers. Mm -hmm. I love those couples because they had done the hard work, like you said. Not denying anything. Oh, they had gone through hell together. They learned how to talk about all the hard things. They learned how to get vulnerable Mm -hmm. and honest and oh they did excruciating work but they are you're right I call it courageous love brave love they did it and so I you know you and I gosh girl we could do this for like 10 hours (laughs) and maybe we We need to you know what I mean we're gonna have to get you to come back before your big move okay for sure Hector we got to figure this out Because, um, again, you and I both have a passion for this. And we want to, honestly, we consider this like a public service. Mm -hmm. Like, we've got to talk about human sexuality. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, it actually is destroying our lives and other people's lives and our marriages and all kinds of goodness that could be happening. And I don't want to leave out single people right, at all. Because singles, you are just as sexual as anybody else. And so let's not deny that. Yeah. And uh, so thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. Man, this has been amazing. I just ha- have loved every bit of it. Me just too. being able to talk about um, something that I do believe in. I'm so thankful for God yeah. that he did design us as sexual beings. Me too. But that we reclaim that back because mm. Satan's had a heyday with it. Oh, my gosh. And he right. and it's not new. I know you know this too, yeah. with all your theology uh, mm-hmm. background and all that. Satan's come after sexuality from the beginning, forever, forever. Yeah, and he's not going to stop. No. And as Christians, that ought to be an indicator for us. Ah, sex and sexuality must be pretty important to God, or Satan wouldn't come after distorting it and destroying it. That's right as many creative, awful ways as he does. It's because it is so important. It is such a sweet, it's meant to be so sweet and endearing. And so, yes, 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 yes. We need to reclaim this. So thank you for all the work you do. I appreciate you. I respect you. I admire you. Love you for how you just have Mm. done so much hard work with so many people, and you're not afraid of it. You're you are a courageous woman, Mm. and so Hector, I'll have to have Deb back and do this again. So, dear friends, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a joy for us to have this conversation, and we just pray that 
um, this conversation has blessed you, helped you. Maybe it stirred some things up for you. If you are struggling with sexual pain, please don't continue to just force trying to make this happen. Sex is not a performance. You are not less than. If you're experiencing sexual difficulties, you are not shameful. Please call a time out. Get the help you need through a great sex therapist. Also, nowadays, there are pelvic floor specialists. Yes. That can be helpful. They have are discovering some hormonal help that can be yes. helpful. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to say there's no magic wand. This is a process. No easy fix. No, there's no easy fixes. And sometimes... I think sometimes we in our field can sound like, well, do this, this, and this. And Debbie and I both know that every person is their own sexual creature and they are on their own sexual journey. And so please let it be this journey where you stay curious and where you stay kind with yourself and with your spouse and um, let it unfold. And trust that in the process, you will be doing some of your own beautiful growth, your own beautiful development. And this is about more than your sexuality. And it is about your sexuality. So thank you for joining us today. We love you. I imagine at one time you were this brilliant little child. As we enter into adulthood, what was brilliant in childhood can actually get in the way of you living the life you want to live. Hello friends, I'm Nancy Houston. I want to help you live a better life. We're all emotional creatures who sometimes think. And so it's so important that we make this journey from our heads into the depths of our hearts. Welcome to The In-Between with Nancy Houston.